This is BBC Scotland. Erskine Bridge northbound, there were about 45 minute delays of coming off the, off the westbound carriageway of the M8. Police Scotland will update me, they say, on that in the next few minutes, so I'm looking back to you on that. There's a sting in the tail end of winter. The weather has become the news, and reporting Scotland is dealing with the biggest story of the year so far. We've got teams out across the country. I've been talking to them, I've been talking to reporters here in Glasgow. But it's a huge story for Scotland and a huge story for the whole of the UK. Right. And you're just getting no information from anyone at all about the delays? What dealings have we had with the air court today? Uh, Hensel went down there yeah, earlier. Because so I've just had a call yeah, from someone who's, who's yeah. stranded. Yeah. You and it's it's so bad down, down there that the um, he was saying well, that he'd heard from staff that they wanted to get the Red Cross and other agencies involved. Because they've got all these stranded people there. Would you go for any particular time period within that warning uh, zone for them to be at their heaviest or most prolonged? That's what the police are saying. They're, they're not going to be stuck in their cars for two or three hours. Has anyone been in touch with us who's in a car and it's gridlocked that we can speak to? Reporting Scotland's editor is in charge of how best to tell the story of the widespread disruption caused by the so-called beast from the east. People will turn to us to tell them the latest news, the situation out there, what's important, can they get home from work, can they get into work, what's going to happen tomorrow. The immediacy of today's news and broadcasting technology and the expectations of the audience are a world away from the pace of current affairs half a century ago. BBC television news comes from Alexandra Palace in North London. News is received here from BBC reporters and cameramen stationed all over the country. All news programmes in Scotland came from the network. News bulletins here were brief. At Stephen's shipyard in Lindhouse, Glasgow, the third biggest shipyard in the Clyde, engineers have been warned that a number of them will have to be paid off. Basic. A pair of ospreys have recently hatched eggs in Speyside. They're believed to be the only nesting pair in Britain, and with a sound recording of the chick on the day it was hatched. <laughs> and quite frankly, sometimes bizarre. <laughs> Scotland was about to get its own news programme, courtesy of the new and dynamic young boss of BBC Scotland. I think we all felt that it was quite wrong that uh, being one nation and with st three studios all over the country, that we shouldn't use them, that we shouldn't demonstrate, if you like, that Aberdeen is as important as Edinburgh and Edinburgh is as important as Glasgow. Copying an idea from America, Alistair Milne used all three studios as bases in one news programme. It's a very different country, 1968, in all sorts of ways. It was a place where the English newspapers only made their way to the north of Scotland, sometimes at lunchtime, sometimes as late. The Guardian was the latest, usually, at uh, 3, 3 p.m., where people still worked on Christmas Day, where they were still, it was still only a couple of years away from free Kirk ministers lie, lying down to prevent the ferries to sky on, on Sundays. Reporting Scotland absolutely was the first time that, that, that Scotland had a national voice as a country on public broadcasting television. A two-hour strike by post office counter and clerical staff, a drop in the unemployment figures in Scotland. An entente very cordial. Tonight's extended programme will be looking... One of Reporting Scotland's first presenters was Mary Marquis, who was to become synonymous with the news here. Fifty years on, we went out and about to find out what Reporting Scotland viewers remember about the programme. And, of course, Mary. That's a while ago. Yeah, long time ago. Virtually every town was affected. Remember Mary Marquis? I remember her, yes, the television, yes. Mary Marquis! There she is. Oh, I loved her. What a looker. Nice Car brooch, too. Aye, nice brooch, aye. Oh, Mary Marquis. Now, adored Mary Marquis. She sort of shared a hairstyle with James Brown. 
which just endeared me to her anyway. But she had that regal quality, always had that regal quality. Always felt like she was floating just above the news, but still imparting the news. <laughs> Whenever we have tour groups here, they are always amazed. They imagine this fantastic light entertainment yes, set yeah. Although Reporting Scotland transmits from a new broadcasting centre, the job of presenter is comparatively unchanged. This is our home. Half a century after she first presented Reporting Scotland, Mary was heading back to the hot seat. It's mm. funny when the lights are not on, all the, the glamour seems yeah. to have gone. Yes, oh, I see. You see? Oh, yes. Yes. Would you like to have a seat? Oh, why not? Why not? It's a roly pit. The death to the end. Here we are. With wheels on so they can get rid of this mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. I there see, yes. So this is. Obviously. Do you still get recognised? You must do. Well, they ask me if I'm um, related because I'm very... because you're a didspit of that woman. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, what do you then say? I said, funny, you should say that. We, there is a resemblance. I've often been told or, or something, you know. Back in 1968, just weeks after Reporting Scotland was launched, this studio debate discussed its birth. Well, um, I don't like the new format for uh, what used to be called uh, Quick Look Round and mm -hmm. is now called Reporting Scotland. I think Mary Marquis is a marvellous interviewer and I think for one thing you're wasting her talent so I. completely. Um, I tend to rightly or wrongly, you think of a ship as she, and I think of a newspaper as a he. Therefore, to me, uh, to begin with, a female newsreader is quite wrong. Well, I think Pat, uh, men have always had, or regarded as having, more authority. That's a better way of putting it. Um, and that, of course, spilled into telling news and so forth. Can that really be true if this woman is telling us? They forgot about um, headmistresses and matrons and all the rest, you know. And um, I think it's a very good thing now that there's a preponderance of women when you switch on. Uh, they're everywhere. This is BBC One Scotland. Margot MacDonald. As Scotland moved into the 1970s, reporting Scotland found its feet and its audience. When astronaut Neil Armstrong visited Langham... And we're waiting here at Grangemars for the first of the 40s oil to come on stream here. And there indeed it is, the 40s oil. Live, on location for the first time from the scene of a breaking news story the devastating Clarkston gas explosion. Now ...that some people may still be trapped inside. And now back to the studio. A comprehensive roundup of Scottish news with Scottish voices. ...the main Aberdeen Stonehaven Road. But was there an aspect of Scottish contemporary life missing from its coverage? Four, three... There's hardly ever an occasion when a Rangers Celtic game is not the most important on the football fixture list because whatever anyone else says about them, either one of them is always there at the end of the day. Archie McPherson. What you don't see in... I mean, Archie McPherson, a proper legend of broadcasting, had the chance to meet him recently and I actually told him to his face. Yeah, that's... Not okay, here, cut, is it? In the mid-70s, there was a rigid division between sport and news, and to where sport could be placed within news. Never the twain shall meet. And then I talked to uh, George Sinclair, who was the editor of Reporting Scotland at that time, and I suggested to him that sport was part of so much of people's lives in Scotland, and he was convinced. And consequently, I started the first regular Friday night previews within Reporting Scotland. You also had a unique access that well, it doesn't exist anymore now, it's also controlled. Well, we could, um, you, you could phone up a player, you could phone up a manager and make an appointment with them and see them or just bump into them in the street or take them for a meal, um, it, it get to what was not really a, a formal press conference, but just a get together with the press and a manager or a player. Now it's drilled, now it's controlled. Now you've got to put in permission to do this and to do that. So I lived in a much freer area. And I think uh, a news programme like Reporting Scotland got the benefit of, of that. 
Now it's much more difficult for them, for them to penetrate and get what they want. The, workers here at the job of a news reporter has also changed hugely. But this is history in the making. Technology has enabled live reporting and footage from almost anywhere. The couple's court appearance lasted only a few minutes. Good heavens, Planned is that me? Policeman and a policewoman, they pleaded oh. not guilty to all charges. Paddy Christie began reporting in an era when film footage took hours to process. If a story happened after three in the afternoon, it didn't make the programme. I look so young there. <laughs> and there were other obstacles. There were two of us, two reporters, two female reporters in the newsroom. And believe me, we were actually well able to hold our own against the men who all thought they were wonderful because they were on television, of course. It's been a relatively quiet night here at Peterhead Prison. You were a formidable character. Was I? Yes, you were. I remember when I started, I was a bit afraid of you. Well, I, I was nice to you, I hope. You yeah, were, <laughs> but, but you were still, I think, how should we say, assertive. You have to be assertive, I suppose. You had to be assertive, and I mean, some men saw you as being aggressive. Uh, when you weren't aggressive, you were just actually trying to get your place in the team. So, so you've agreed to do one last shift for us. One last shift. <laughs> just to see <laughs> how things have changed. It. <laughs> All right, well, we teamed you up with one of our top people, Nick Hurdley. Morning, how are you doing? doing? I'm fine, nice how are you? Nice to meet you. You too. You both ready for this? I think yep. so. All right, OK, right well, have a good day. <laughs> Political correspondent Nick Hurdley embodies today's multi-platform TV, online and social media journalism. Do you know what? The one thing I avoided was politics. I hated politics. That's the thing about what it's called in the graphics, but I'm quite on the money. Mm -hmm. Excited even before I started. Checking graphics. <laughs> Hello there, and yes, a wintry start for quite a few of us this morning. Oh, oh Heather with the weather. Well, that was she? last week. <laughs> Good evening. This oh, is, oh, they've lost the hair. <laughs> 15,000 workers at Britain's four rock. That's Viv Lumsden's man. I dropped in on Viv and her man, my fellow. <laughs> this is not going to work. <laughs> Professionals? <laughs> <laughs> well, I started as a reporter. All set and uh, hopefully in good running order for the borders tomorrow. Uh, then there was the, uh, the evening where I was the only reporter in the newsroom and somebody had, there'd been some confusion over the presenting rotor. So uh, one of the sub-editors in the newsroom looked around, I was the only one there, and he said, Alan, you're presenting the programme. And this was with about a quarter of an hour to go. I'd been in the studio on occasions, obviously, but I'd never presented the programme. Good evening. The threat of permanent closure at British Rail Island's Albion Works in Glasgow has been withdrawn. But then you never looked back because you were never a regular. Oh, presenter. never looked back. It was the start. <laughs> no, it's a bit like being thrown at the deep end. Good evening. In a miraculous escape... It was fabulous at the time. When I was at BBC, it was the 80s, and it was the Joan Collins kind of thing with huge shoulders enormous great earrings, and that's just you. <laughs> um, and big jewellery, I mean, and I remember... big hair. Big hair, oh, uh, the hair was the main thing with me, because it never does the same thing twice. And of course it changed, and it was up one day and down the next, and back on one side and back on the other. And that, that in a superficial way, that kind of is interesting to, to people. So it shouldn't have been distracting, but I was just conforming to the fashions of the time. Now, looking back, it looks ludicrous. And I mean, that, talk about dynasty, good mm. grief. And that's it for tonight's edition of Reporting Scotland. We'll be back on Monday at the usual time to start our 22nd year. Till then... Good night. Uh, I don't miss it, really, I have to say. Um, I, I quite like slipping into the anonymity um, because, obviously, the people who remember me on air are getting older, are old, like me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, don't, I, I like the anonymity of being able to walk into a charity shop and not being thought to be down on my luck. But uh, I, 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 I don't miss it in the slightest. I've, I almost... I mean, my grandchildren now are kind of... You were on television? They are amazed that, you know, I'm not terribly interested, I have to say. The Conservative Party 
is determined to effect a real improvement in the machinery of government in Scotland. This speech, made just weeks after reporting Scotland went on air, became known as the Declaration of Perth and has been a factor in political change that has reverberated down the decades. There shall be a Scottish Parliament. I like that. The last half century has seen seismic changes in Scottish politics at unprecedented pace. Let's do this now. People will answer the question, should Scotland be an independent country? Scotland has voted against independence. The First Minister is stepping down. We're told more powers will come to the Scottish Parliament. Tonight on Reporting Scotland, a divided United Kingdom. Should Scotland? Oh, the independence referendum. What did you vote for? First Minister stepping down. We're told more powers will come oh, to the Scottish boy. Parliament. Danny watches the news four times a day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner and supper. And you've got an opinion on everything? Yeah, yes. oh, I shout that, yeah. I hate the news I so watch, much. I, must I watch GMTV. Me, I watch what about the younger generation, though? They... No. I think if I watched the news, I'd be a bit more clued in. Like, especially with things like elections, I feel like I really miss out on a lot of key points. Like, I, I don't necessarily know enough to vote I correctly. Like 50 /50. Like, yeah. I was like, do you mean some, some of our pals do, some don't? Yeah. When the voting goes on and everything and they need to give their votes, they can give it for a good reason and not just go behind what their parents are maybe thinking or whatever. Good evening. Sean Connery has urged the people of Scotland to turn out in large numbers. And the programme hasn't really come up for air, has it, since? devolution. There seems now to be a, a more of a focus on politics. W would you agree with that? One of the reasons that I moved back to Scotland um, after pursuing my career in London for a long time was because uh, devolution was about to arrive and I thought that would be so journalistically interesting. And since then, of course, we've had the independence referendum and um, it's been great to be at the heart of that. The national news programme has got a huge challenge to bring home the diversity of a country to, uh, to itself. Representing the nation is a huge challenge when there isn't a kind of central national narrative. And in Scotland, maybe there now is some sort of central national narrative. It's associated with political change in a way which is difficult to report without aligning with, without you know, accusations of bias. I had a Twitter account and you just knew that whenever you had done an interview with anybody, you would go on there and find abuse and find people accusing you of being a paid up member of whichever uh, party you were or were not interviewing that night. But I reckoned that as long as you were getting that kind of flack from both sides, um, as I was, uh, I think we all were, then we probably were, were doing our jobs. It's a measure of how passionately people feel about these issues. The Overgate of the Song, a thriving Dundee artery bordered by numerous cobbled lanes and alleys. Is no For three decades, Brian Taylor has been an observer as the heat and the cauldron of Scottish politics intensified. If there was a deferential period, it was long before my time. I'm not saying that's a consequence of, of my character. It's not. That, that had changed. You know, the day when a, uh, a reporter would go up to an arriving minister at the, air, the aircraft and say, is there anything you'd like to say, minister? And the minister would ponder for a second and say, no, I don't think so. And that was the end of the interview. I think those days are long, long gone. And we're gone from the, the early days of reporting Scotland. The campaign continues and the dream shall never die. And now I'm very happy to answer a few questions. Brian Taylor. Thank you, very you can much. be polite, you can be amicable, you can, uh, you can have um, uh, friends and chums among politicians. As long as you bear in mind and they bear in mind, and mostly they do, the, the smart ones do, that you're not working for them, you're working for the people. You're trying to find stuff out on behalf of the people. John, you've been doing this job for a long time. How has the technology changed for you? Well, uh, as you can see, I'm filming this by myself. At uh, one time, we used to do this uh, with two, maybe three people, 
Um, but now the camera technology insists uh, that it can record sound. You no longer need a separate sound recording device. And uh, as you can see, Nick is filming me on uh, iPhone. And even the uh, iPhone pictures can then be used uh, for content on online and TV. Uh, well, we've got, can we ask you a quick question, sir? We'll only be a quick segment from Reporting Scotland. Do you think on the whole that Brexit is going well or not? No. You don't think it's going well? Mm. Why not? One more person, if anyone else comes back. Oh, look, I knew he's, that's his phone night again. You know, he's not paying attention, that's he's on his phone. something happening. Hello there. Can we ask you a quick question? We're from Reporting Scotland. Sir, can we ask you a quick question? This is my colleague. Paddy, who used to do report in Scotland, I do Indeed. report in Scotland <laughs> now. Remember Paddy did? <laughs> yeah, Scotland. It was very good in those days, wasn't it? It was excellent. Not, it was not You're a doing deal. two things at once there. You're not concentrating on either of them. OK. There's been no deal in these talks in London, as we expected. I think they're going to get a deal. I'm absolutely fascinated by that. <laughs> I'm glad you told me that. I would have been That's really, a good thing about Twitter. We would I would have been that. really upset had I had to wait <laughs> to learn that on tonight's news. Dear I say, how did it go? I enjoyed it. I don't know about Nick. I enjoyed it too. What you are using, the, the, the phones, the iPads, the whatever, makes your life much easier. Uh, because if I was trying to contact the office, I either had to find a telephone booth uh, or I had to be in one of the BBC vans with a mobile phone in it. And that took up, that could take up a lot of time that you didn't have. So it is easier for you in a way. But then again, it's more difficult because you don't have time to spend on one particular thing. You're doing so many things at once. Can you see the advantages of being a reporter back in Paddy's day when you had to feed the 6.30 news and that was the only thing. Absolutely, because you're, yeah. you're focused on that final product, aren't yes. you? On getting the story right for the massive audience you have on Reporting Scotland. Mm -hmm. we, we were talking about this, how you would have time to reflect on the interviews you'd done, on you know, the various lines yeah. that you'd got over the course of the day. Did you both enjoy the day? Thoroughly. It's been you great. both learned? Yeah, I That's mean, quite sweet. the thing I think is so important for, for young reporters, or younger reporters, as I, I don't know, am I young anymore? Yes, you are. The thing that's important, I think, for developing and younger reporters is to learn from people who, who did the big stories back in the day, who had the time to, to do things perfectly. And, and who are still remembered by people in the street 30 years later. Still a celebrity. <laughs> A picture began to emerge about what happened on Piper Alpha. Such is the nature of news, that it's often the tragedies, the disasters that resonates down the years. Good evening. Locker Bay turns out to the funeral of the first of its own victims of the Pan Am disaster. For Dunblane's primary one pupils, Wednesday, March the 13th, started just like any other day. Parents gathered on hearing the news reports emerged. I mean, Dunblane was just one of those days that uh, gym, you couldn't quite believe what you were seeing. I remember where I was that day. Inside yeah. that gym earlier today, not only were 16 youngsters and their teacher brutally murdered, but the lives of their families and friends were changed forever. Wednesday, March the 13th, started just like Good evening from Glasgow's George Square. Usually at this time of year, a place of such joy. Tonight, it's a scene of tragedy. There are also landmark moments. It's the Portmas. <laughs> well, Paul. Well, that must have been Scotland. Gordon when the, it came to Scotland. Aye. So I went to Catholic school, so it was empty that day. It was just me sitting there, I was only long Catholic, but when? I didn't get a good look up at him, because I was up at the top. Out of oh, the yes. Industrial adversity, the 1970s came forth. Remember that? And there will be no hooliganism. Oh, Rig. Yeah. There will be no babying. <laughs> babying. <laughs> <laughs> Been by far Team Scotland's best ever performance at a Commonwealth Games. We have taken 19 golds, 15 silver, and a thunderstorm, man. There he is, boy. On your cell, wee man.
The day-to-day -day business of reporting on events that impact on all our lives continues to be reporting Scotland's role. Snow has cleared workplaces around the country, including the BBC, where most staff have been sent home. By contrast, the newsroom is having one of its busiest days. A few problems in Dumfries and Galloway as well today, especially between Beeswing and the BT if you're heading on the A711. In the borders, the A68 is particularly bad at Carter Bar. Uh, green lots of help. The decision is made to extend tonight's programme. You've got like really deep snow in Edinburgh. It's not something we do often. Well, that's not this. Yeah. Where did we get the gold? There's a couple of incentives yeah. yeah. and people People will be tweeting pictures, they'll be putting things on Instagram. We uh, monitor that across uh, our social media platforms and then we can engage with our audience directly. So Ian says he's happy to do something. We have a connection with our viewers like never before. All Glasgow services have now been cancelled. Stagecoach East Scotland have withdrawn all their services from the west of Dunfermline. First Burst have cancelled all services in the Greater Glasgow. As reporting Scotland's on-air time draws near, the task is to gather and structure the many strands of this developing story. A long, cold wait to get home. These commuters in the centre of Glasgow left work early to... I am getting ready to set off to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, which is just down the road in Govan, we're obviously in Govan, uh, to do a live on hospital cancellations, operations that are being cancelled, outpatient appointments that are being cancelled for some health boards in the red affected area of Scotland. Television has changed so much of our lives. The challenge for television news now and in the future is how to win over today's young audiences who know most of the headlines and who'll have seen the pictures on their phones before we come on air. Can we get Jackie in, please? Bonging on air, Jackie on three, over line A into sort and line B. Sort and line B is 11 seconds. Headlines, everybody, stand by. And that is all from the BBC News at six, now on BBC. Frame up roof camera. Here we go. Three, two, one. Tonight, on an extended edition of Reporting Scotland. Sot and Phoenix. Go to get home and stay there. Sot. Well, the weather's the weather. We're in Scotland. Cancelled or delayed as the worst of the weather hits. Bong. Q. Joy for school pupils. Radio 1600 schools are closed across the red weather warning area. And I'll be in the borders with the latest on how they've been battling the blizzards. Right, let's come to two and two an enemy. Good evening. A red weather alert is active for much of eastern and central Scotland. The demise of traditional television news has long been predicted. We're on VT for three minutes. And yet, when this snow struck, one of Reporting Scotland's biggest ever audiences tuned in. 30 seconds to you, just about 30 seconds to you. Jim, yes. And what of the next 50 years? Well, when the beast from the east is a blast from the past, the task for Reporting Scotland is to innovate, to stay relevant, and to be Scotland's news. Right, we're off the air. Well done, everybody. Hold on a second.